Well, good afternoon, everyone. We will uh, begin our media availability with the, uh, our chief medical officer with the uh, update for today. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining today. As usual, I'll begin with an update on the number of cases in our province. Since the media briefing yesterday, we have four new positive cases. These cases are within Eastern and Central Health regions. The public health contact tracing is ongoing and everyone considered close contacts will be advised to quarantine. The total number of cases in our province is now 236. By region, we have 221 in Eastern Health, eight in Central Health, one in Western Health, and six in Labrador Grenfell Health. 53% of cases are female and 47% are male. By age, we have 20 people under the age of 20, 35 between 20 and 39, 33 between 40 and 49, 52 between 50 and 59, 51 between 60 and 69, and 45 who are over 70. Six people are in hospital due to the virus, and of these patients, two are in intensive care. 96 people have now recovered, and in total, we have tested 4,390 people. While we have four new cases confirmed since yesterday, it is important to remember there may be cases that we don't know about. To ensure we are finding as many people as possible who are infected with the virus, we are broadening testing criteria. We know there are many people who have the virus but have mild symptoms for which they would not normally seek medical attention. Broadening our testing criteria will allow more of these people to be identified. Once found, public health can then identify and quarantine close contacts and help to further reduce the spread of COVID-19. I would like to emphasize once again the importance of staying home and maintaining safe physical distancing in this coming weekend. The presentation shared by Dr. Raman last evening provided us with some perspective on how COVID-19 is currently progressing in our province. Our intended efforts seem to be working. However, we can also see that if we deviate from our current course, our healthcare system will quickly become overburdened. Our data shows that if we reach the peak of this virus too quickly, the result will be catastrophic in our province. This is a stark but important message. The slower the curve rises, the better prepared we will be to respond. If you do have to go out for essentials, I recommend the use of a properly fitted homemade or non-medical mask. This is an easy additional measure to protect others around you by preventing your respiratory droplets from being spread to others or landing on surfaces. This is particularly important if you may unknowingly have the virus. I can tell you for certain that there is no drug or vaccine that will prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our communities, but rather our own actions and behaviors. So stay home. Wash your hands often and well. Practice proper cough and sneeze etiquette and only go out when it is absolutely necessary. This is truly our best defense. As a recap for those who may have just joined us, we have four new cases since yesterday's media availability. The total number of cases in the province is 236. We have 221 cases in Eastern, eight in Central, one in Western and six in Labrador Grenfell Health. We know the sacrifices we are asking you to make are great, but the consequences of not making them are greater. Please continue to do your part to slow the spread of COVID-19 in our communities. My wish for all of you this Easter weekend is to stay healthy and safe. May you find time to slow down and relax, to virtually connect with your family and friends and find peace in knowing that you are doing your part to protect yourselves, your loved ones, and those in your community who are most vulnerable. Our collective actions will have a significant impact on how COVID-19 progresses in our province. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. And you may mention 
on the uh, analysis that was done by Dr. Raman last night. He leads our core analytics team. And he presented projections for the next 30 to 60 days, as you've mentioned. And the information that was provided last night was really about making sure that we have our health care system planned and prepared for the impacts and projections that he outlined to us last night. He did present a very strong picture and a very clear message to Newfoundlanders and Labradorians that every single move you make this weekend and beyond will determine our future. Your actions will determine the turning point of this virus. And as I said last night, it is not a test of the system. It's a test of you. The system fails only if you fail. What we're asking you, well, it isn't that hard. We're asking you to make some good choices. Essential travel only. No shed parties. No parties at the cabin this weekend. We're asking you to make the right decisions. Let's stay the course. And while you're doing that, we will continue to provide supports and services for you and your families during this health care crisis. We know it's a tough time. There's a couple of areas that I'd like to touch on today, and once again, I'd like to make mention of our joint all-party committee. And we meet every day to discuss every aspect of health care, this health crisis, how it's impacting you and our province. So once again, I want to recognize and thank the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Chess Crosby, and Leader of the Third Party, Ms. Allison Coffin, and their colleagues for their continued cooperation, their input, and support. After all, we're all working towards the same goal of protecting you and your families. We are heading into what is typically a busy weekend in our province, but it's an exciting one for our youngest population. So I want to take a moment now to talk to the children throughout Newfoundland and Labrador. First of all, I want to thank you for the good job that you're doing to keep safe for staying home, staying inside. That's the best thing that you can do right now. So keep up that good work. And just because you can't go to a playground, meet with your friends, doesn't mean that you can't create some of your own fun at home. Now, I've seen some pretty great ideas that you and your parents have been sharing on social media. You've been, building, you've been building forts, playing some musical instruments. Not that I could ever do that. I cannot play a musical instrument. Some of you are drawing pictures. You're baking cupcakes. You're painting your windows in preparation for Easter. Pretty cool ideas. And I know from my own experience, I've been watching my own granddaughter, Antonia. She's been baking cakes for Pop and Nan and family painting pictures that are in the mail, I know. So I just want to say and take this opportunity to tell my own granddaughter that I will miss her and I do love her. But I know it's an exciting weekend for all of you as you're looking forward to the Easter Bunny. Now, I've had some contact. Some of you contacted me this week asking me if the Easter Bunny is going to be able to visit. And I can tell you, indeed, the Easter Bunny is an essential worker, a very important essential worker. So I checked in with the Easter Bunny this week. And although it's tough and difficult, Easter Bunny, fast and quick, not sure if you'll get to every home around the world, but will do the very best job. The Easter Bunny also said they might have some Easter eggs for some, but they're looking at probably changing it up a little this year. Maybe draw some pictures, paint some Easter eggs, or even write a personal letter. I think that's pretty cool. You can get some sweets, sure, almost any time during the year, but drawing and getting a letter from the Easter Bunny, that is something very special, one for the memory bank. So I wish you and your family all the very best this Easter weekend. And whatever you decide to do, 
the Easter Bunny asked me to tell you that make sure you stay safe, stay inside, stay healthy. One of the things we have to accept that this is a very different year. What has been normal throughout our lifetime, well, that's changed. And now more than ever, we have to realize that our actions this weekend and beyond will determine our future. The decisions we make as residents of our province, well, it can make it or break it. So please enjoy your Easter weekend the best that you can. Check in with loved ones and friends through FaceTime, through Skype. Attend an online church service. Set up an online play date for your kids. We're in a different time. There's no question about that. But it's how we decide to face the adversity that will impact our own well-being and the well-being of those around us. We have to remain positive as best we can. Let's look at making new memories, new ways of making new memories, create some new traditions, and open our minds some to new ideas. And speaking of new ideas, more than 90 schools from St. John's to Nain and all points in between came together virtually with some very special guests to celebrate our collective strength and unity as we face challenges presented by this pandemic. They sang, Oh Canada. If you haven't seen it already, make sure you check it out at the Newfoundland and Labrador English School District social media pages. And at the end of this event, we would probably even be playing it for you. So kudos to all involved. And speaking of thanks, as we head into the weekend, there's a few people that you cannot see in this room that I want to give a big shout out to. These are the people behind the scenes, just a very small group that make this happen every day. In fact, today marks 30 straight days. So Derek, it was a familiar face for me. He's behind the camera, essentially a one-person show, operating all the technical equipment for us every day. Thank you. And then we have the interpreters. We have Heather and Sheila, who are providing a much-needed service to those who are deaf and hard of hearing. And I'd also like to give a shout-out to the folks at Eastern Audio for assisting us with, this, with the audio. They are all working extremely hard to provide this service. And by the way, keeping physical distance at the forefront. So thank you to all of you. It is greatly appreciated. I will now pass it over to Mr. Hagee for some comments. Thank you very much, uh, Premier. And I think before I start my comments, it's worth mentioning the guy to my left who's uh, kept things together for the last uh, 30 days. So thank you very much. The projections we heard from Dr. Rahman uh, yesterday are homegrown. They were designed to help us, to help the department and the regional health authorities over the next 30 days uh, to plan. Uh, and as data comes in, uh, they will roll their projections forward, uh, always keeping 30 days in mind. That ability to, to predict in the short term will help guide our efforts to make sure our capacity is ready, as ready as it can be, for when the surge arrives. The problem with models is that they are educated guesses. It's a crystal ball that is really not all that crystal clear. The Government of Canada today has released its own modeling and projections. And whilst they differ in some degree uh, and reflect a national picture, the messages they send are the same ones that Dr. Rahman repeated yesterday and that you've heard the Premier and Dr. Fitzgerald and myself repeat for the last 30 days. The important things that we need to do now are physical distancing, we need to engage in active contact tracing, but we need to persevere with these 
over time? And is that last bit that becomes harder as time goes by without always a clear end in sight? All I can do is encourage each and every one of you that that ability to stick at it is what we need at this particular time. Dr. Fitzgerald has also augmented the recommendations today with advice uh, begun by Dr. Tam nationally about the use of non-surgical uh, homemade cloth masks. I would emphasize again that these are not a substitute for physical distancing, for good hand hygiene, for not touching your face, and all the other things that we have emphasized over the last little while. The other thing about the use of uh, personal protection uh, in the public, gloves and these masks, is that they need to be disposed of properly. We've seen too many pictures on social media uh, and the municipal uh, workers are not really there to tidy up after you. So take them home and put them away properly. We have orders in place. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald's recommendations in our state of emergency have the force of law and regulation. We've been in discussions with the constabulary, with the uh, Mounties, and we have our uh, contact form available for those who feel there have been infractions. The RNC have said that they will step up patrols. The RCMP stand ready to uh, enforce those orders. Um, they both agree that education and encouragement are the preferred tools. But to help them, uh, we have streamlined the process of enforcement so that now, instead of a drawn-out uh, arrest form uh, and a court appearance, uh, they can now issue summary offence tickets. And I would remind you that for an individual for the first offence alone, that is $500 as a minimum. For a business, that is $5,000 as a minimum. And that is per offence. Each day is another offence and the scale of fines escalates to $2,500 a day for an individual and up to $50,000 for a business. The owner or operator or director of a business is also, in the law, personally liable for each day as an individual as well as a corporation. We don't want to have to use these, but it is a, a measure of the severity of the situation in which we find ourselves. Essential travel has been emphasized over and over again, and that is the key. Does your journey support your health directly, or is it that you are a worker essential to the running of the services that currently take place? These things produce all sorts of stresses, and we've seen an uptick uh, from our support through the mental health uh, work and workers that we have. There is a warm line, it's 1-855-753-2560 for people who want to speak to a peer support worker. I would encourage you to use that. For kids, text TALK to 686868. For those people who struggle with the rigours of, of isolation uh, from the point of view of the practicalities of life, we have the Red Cross on side, one 800 863 6582. We are coming up to the first major holiday of the year. Easter is a special time both for people in the faith community and for families, but this year we need to mark it differently. Dr. Fitzgerald and the Premier have both emphasized that. We need to stay home. You need to make a bubble of protection around yourself and your family and stay in it and don't burst anyone else's. What we do this weekend will determine what happens to us and our loved ones in the coming weeks. 
There is no vaccine for this virus. There is no cure for this virus. And there is no specific treatment for this virus. And it discriminates against no one. We must get it right. This is the time to do it. Thank you very much, Premier. Back to you. Thank you. And thank you once again, Minister Eggy, for, the, for those very clear and strong messages. As we, uh, as everyone has mentioned, we're heading into the Easter weekend. I would just really want to advise our viewers uh, for daily updates that we'll see some changes uh, tomorrow and Saturday and Sunday. We'll come back again on Monday at the regular time on Monday afternoon for our regular br briefings. This is really to give some of the staff that has been working to give them a little break and some extra time that they need to refresh. As we know, this is a long time. This is a journey and uh, we'll be back with the regular briefings on Monday afternoon, but we will provide the updates, the overnight updates, as we did yesterday uh, around 2 o'clock. That will be through a media release. So thank you, and just to once again reiterate, have a, a good weekend. Follow the health guidelines. Make sure the cho shopping trips are essential only, uh, one per week. Stay safe and stay home. It is not a time for complacency as we head into this weekend. I will now open it up for the media for their questions. For the benefit of our speakers, we have eight reporters registered for today's call. In the essence of time, each reporter will have the opportunity to ask two questions. We suggest that you not ask rumor-based questions. The purpose of these briefings is to address COVID-19 issues. All other government-related issues should, should be directed to the appropriate department or agency for response. Reporters will ask questions in the order they re were registered for today's call and we will run through the telephone queue. I will call each reporter by name to ask questions, so please do not press star one until your name has been called. Following this, should time permit, reporters will be individually asked for single questions. This call will end at 2.59 p.m., but we ask viewers to stay tuned to watch the video that has been prepared by the Newfoundland and Labrador English School District. Our first questions today are from Kelly Ann Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. Uh, Minister, yesterday regarding the projections that were provided and made available, uh, it notes that a restructuring of the ICU is needed. You did mention this. Is there any more um, clear plan on how that's going to work? It's a good question. The um, graphic that Dr. Rahman got from uh, Kaihai yesterday had a bar on it that indicated capacity under each of three categories. One was uh, acute care beds, one was ICU beds, and one was ventilators. Those bars move. Those were the bars in place the day the data was run. And for ICU, for example, on that day, there were only 57 of our 98 beds that were vacant. Uh, that uh, allows us, uh, hopefully, to be able to increase uh, capacity um, uh, by freeing up ICU beds. If not, then you could see from the first graphic under the better case scenario where we follow all these rules, as it were, and keep to the uh, social distancing, physical distancing, and the things we have in place. Under that scenario, you would see there was leeway on the hospital beds elsewhere in facilities. And each of the RHAs has plans in place to expand ICU level of care into those beds should the need arise. Our challenge will be about identifying staff, and they're working on that as we speak. So this is part of the, use, the usefulness of Dr. Rahman's 30-day projections. It allows us to see what we need to do to be ready. Thank you. And um, this may have been asked. We're 30 days in, so don't mind me if I've repeated this. But in terms of health benefits for those who have been laid off and still need um, prescriptions filled, but now that's looking like seven hundred dollars out of pocket. What is being done there? Are you talking about? Are you suggesting the health workers of our public sector workers? You mean? Because for those, you know, we have not laid off any public sector workers and the benefits. No, are... no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking um, for general for residents of the province. Um, okay, so sure, IOC has had to lay people off. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, what we have right now is part of the you know federal programming that we're seeing 
is that, you know, with the federal government picking up 75% of the wages, the, the hope here is that many of those will stay attached, you know, to the employer. The employer, if at all possible, we realize that they are facing some difficulties as well. But we need to come out of this uh, health crisis and have the economy positioned ready to, uh, to respond. So many uh, employers will stay attached through the 75% wage subsidy that will help them stay attached to their employees. And, if, and when that happens, of course, they stay attached to their benefits. Now, if we do see people that are laid off, there are a number of provincial programs that are available for people that find themselves in undue hardships uh, for prescription medications and so on. So there are a number of provincial programs that are there to help and support some of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians that would find themselves in difficult situations. Thank you. Our next questions are from Holly McKenzie Souter of the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Please first all one at this time. Mr. Hagee, uh, you commented last night on the high number of risk factors in this province being, you know, the um, advanced age and aging population and the high prevalence of chronic conditions that are, you know, known to be risk factors of this illness. I mean, those were not factored in with high highs models that we saw last night, so I'm wondering how those um, factors are affecting how you read these scenarios and whether you think they might be underestimating the actual number of hospitalizations and demand on the ICU that we see here if a lot of people were to become infected. That's a good question. Uh, we, if you look um, at Dr. Rahman's work, he used the data we already had to drive the projections he made. So what he was showing you was descriptions of what has happened already to our ICU population and our hospitalization population, bearing in mind his, uh, his reservation about the small numbers. But essentially, he showed uh, quite clearly from the data that the 55 to 64 age group was particularly susceptible to needing intensive care units. The other piece was that if you had two or more other medical problems, you were far more likely not just to require admission, but also to end up in an intensive care unit. The, that's a description of the situation as it stood. None of this is necessarily very surprising to clinicians, but it does actually help us understand a little bit more about some of the drivers behind the way the disease behaves. Um, it, it's a description of what has happened. In terms of predicting, uh, and identifying risks, it's useful for the individual clinician, the doctor or the nurse practitioner who assesses a person when they arrive uh, at a facility as to where they're likely to end up. Uh, but in terms of, of on population base, we just know that this is what has happened already and we do have high numbers, high proportions of people in this province with more than one condition, and certainly hypertension, high blood pressure, and diabetes, and breathing difficulties, COPD, are, are, uh, are common in this province. Right, so knowing all of that, I mean, um, are the contingency planning for ICU um, additional spaces and that kind of thing being... Uh, moved forward a little bit, knowing that, you know, if 32% of the population does become sick, there are significant risk factors among, among that population? The, the um, projections that were, the model that was produced yesterday accounts for that, and that would indicate where the demand was based on the population that we serve. So the illness piece around those conditions is already factored into the model. It still shows, as you quite rightly point out, under the best case scenario there, where over two years, about a third of the population end up uh, symptomatic at some point from COVID-19, um, that uh, we would have a challenge with the ICU beds. The RHAs are working on that now. Um, they will not act on those plans until the data and the projections from Dr. Uh, Rahman show they need to enact them. But they've identified spaces and options already. Uh, it's just not going to move stuff until it looks as though we need to move it, because these are four weeks out. Our next questions are from Ben Murphy of VOCM News. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, 
Premier, a lot of people here are starting to receive their CERB funding, which is great to hear, but I'm not sure if people, myself included, fully understand how the taxation on this money works, let's say, come next February, March tax season. Do you have any advice for people to maybe be trying to save some portion of this money, if at all possible, for taxation that will eventually come? Yeah, if you read through the programs here, uh, you're, you're right. This is so people would get $2,000 a month, $500 a week, but this will be taxable at their, when they file their taxes for next year. So the uh, so it's it's you know it's wise I think right now as people prepare as they use this money I know some people have been waiting this for quite some time and uh, so but this is taxable income five hundred dollars so when people file their income taxes it will be taxable and the appropriate tax rate will be applied to this money at that time. And Dr. Fitzgerald, you mentioned uh, setting that broadened criteria to identify people with mild symptoms in their contacts. How exactly is that going to work? So uh, we're in the process of finalizing that criteria now, and uh, once uh, we have that in place, we'll be notifying uh, the public as to what that will mean, um, and we'll be updating our uh, 811 um, information to reflect that. Um, so we'll have more information on that in the coming days. Thank you. Our next questions are from Drew Brown of the Independent. Please go ahead. I asked this question yesterday, but I was told to direct it to today's uh, panel. Um, but do we have a regional breakdown um, of ventilators and ICU availability across the province? Yes, we do. Um, in actual fact, you're right. You did ask that question yesterday, and I can provide that for you and your colleagues uh, later on. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't bring it with me. Oh, perfect. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, the other question I had was uh, what measures are in place for those who will need to travel for uh, acute care? For those who need to travel for care within the province, we have the Medical Transportation Assistance Program. There are flights and there are um, uh, availabilities there. Uh, for urgencies, our Medivac system is, is regarded as an essential service, and that's a, a hybrid run between government air services and our two domestic uh, uh, airlines. Uh, that's still available. My understanding is that uh, the amount of travel that's going to be required is going to be significantly reduced. We've had well over 400 physicians and nurse practitioners sign up for virtual care uh, through NLCHI. Uh, so uh, that, combined with the regular telehealth backbone that we already have had for decades, uh, should be uh, um, used to reduce travel where at all possible. There are always going to be people who get acutely sick and would require services that can't, say, be provided in Labrador or in central Newfoundland and have to be uh, moved to the Health Science Centre, our only tertiary care facility. None of that is impacted directly uh, by COVID-19. Just the need for what is non-essential medical appointments should be dramatically curtailed, if not stopped altogether. Hey, perfect. Thank you. Our next questions are from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. The beneficiary uh, in this it should open uh, uh, on April 20th. Uh, that will mean a lot of movement, not only from fish harvesters, but also for fish plant workers. Um, there's also the unique situation of people on, you know, small fishing vessels that be working in close quarters. Um, are people, especially people in, in rural Newfoundland, going to be put at risk with the potential startup of the fishery in this province? It's a difficult situation, Patrick, and you raise. And, and sorry, if, if I could add, if I could add, I'm just looking for specifically uh, 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 Dr. Haggy, Dr. Haggy, or Dr. Fitzgerald to comment on this for sure. Uh, we're looking for uh, a health perspective for sure for these workers. Yep. So sorry, let, sorry for me. Absolutely. So we they can. Uh, Join in here as I finish the opening part of the question. Thank you for that. I mean, this is a concern that's been on the minds of many fish harvesters and fish plant workers and indeed unions and all those that have uh, attached to the fishery. Significant industry in our province, as we know, and especially in rural areas, uh, some 16 to 18,000 jobs in any given year and well over a billion dollars comes into our, our province. So it's very difficult as you just think of the very concept, uh, especially from a fish harvester, how you would actually be able to work in that uh, on a fishing vessel and maintain so or, uh, social and physical distancing and be safe. And likewise with a plant worker, it's, it's very similar. We've been in those situations. They work very close quarters and will be very difficult to adapt 
to that environment. So they're working with the industry. Social distancing in regard to uh, worker safety in that regard. So um, uh, there are, uh, you know, um, a lot of things you have to take into consideration with regard to uh, actual physical spacing as well as uh, how people take their breaks and uh, the number of people you have on working any one shift at a time. So there, there's, um, you know, a lot of information that we've uh, discussed with, with that industry. Patrick, I believe you had a two-part question. Do you have a second question? Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, a lot of uncertainty as well as to, uh, with regards to uh, federal aid for fish harvesters. Um, a lot of financial stressors for, for, uh, for people in that industry. Uh, you know, still waiting on a price, still waiting on quotas. People are worried about, uh, you know, making bad decisions with, with little info. Um, shouldn't, at this point, we're a couple of weeks away from the fishery opening, shouldn't be more preparation and and, and, and won't that ha that lack of clarity have an impact on, on health out outcomes for these people? Yeah, so when you look at the opening and the history of the opening of the fishery in Newfoundland and Labrador, you know, as long as I think I've been doing what I've been doing and in, in, in long before my time in politics, the spring opening the fishery has always had, uh, or not unusual for it to happen, uh, to have some challenges, be it ice conditions around quota pricing and so on. So the start of the fishery uh, overcoming some challenges has been something that we've seen in the past. And of course this year, with the added problems around COVID-19 and, and, uh, and, and the Corona-19 and the corona virus that is having on the impact on all industries, and uh, the fishing industry is, is part of this as well. So we want to work with the industry here, work with the uh, harvesters, plant workers, the unions, but making sure that what we want and paramount to all of this underlying those decisions, it has to have a safe environment for both the harvesters, the processors. And you can have the, the market conditions to all of that, but these are business uh, and economic choices that we have that we will have to make, and we will work with them. But ideally, we must, and fundamental to all of this, is have a safe working environment for all those involved. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. We saw today uh, the, the, their modeling shows that the peak would be in late spring. Our models yesterday show a peak not until late fall. A lot of people are confused about what to expect. What should we make of these differences? I think the only thing you can say is that these are projections. And as a quote, I brought up yesterday from a statistician that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, certainly Dr. Rahman's projections are useful. Uh, the indications of capacity and demand are extremely important and very helpful. We know there will be a peak. We know there will be a surge. The only question really is when. Our geography, uh, be it Labrador as a, a big land or the island as an island, have been regarded traditionally as challenges for tourism, for industry, and these kind of things, they actually now work to our advantage. The other thing that's happened is we have instituted, through our public health legislation, some of the strictest controls and states of emergency that you'll see across the country, and we led the country in doing it. At some point, though, we have to accept the fact the virus is here, it isn't going to go away any time in the short, uh, short term. Uh, and at some point, there will be a peak. Having said that, those are simply projections. Dr. Rahman's rolling 30-day um, analysis will help guide us and warn us and give us what advance notice we can get. Because as he pointed out yesterday, at some point, the numbers will start to tick up faster each day, the so-called exponential growth. And when that happens, we know we're between three and four weeks away from a peak. The other thing we know is the sooner that peak comes, the worse it will be. When looking at those long-term models, it's showing a third of the population getting the disease. So is what we're doing now to actually prevent people from getting the disease or simply just delaying it? What we've done, in actual fact, if you look at Dr. Rahman's slides, is he took uh, a third uh, or 32 percent and, and 51 percent. The range across the globe of the proportion that get infected is between 25 and 78 percent. So it was a reasonable place to land. 
Um, what we have shown and what he has demonstrated from his data is that we've actually done better than the 31% on the suggestions from where our data fits with that model. Uh, if we can keep on doing what we're doing, we can minimize the impact even further. The challenge is that whatever model you look at, and the federal governments today, it, there's a peak, but then there's kind of a wiggly worm-like tail at the end on that right-hand side as it comes and goes over the next 18 months. So whatever happens, this is longer term than shorter. Our next questions are from Elizabeth Witten of All Newfoundland Labrador. Please go ahead. Minister Hagee, you kind of touched on what I wanted to ask a bit more about a few moments ago, but, you know, we've heard a lot about an upcoming surge, but I'm curious, in terms of numbers, what will a surge like look to Newfoundland and Labrador? Because we're a different province than, say, Ontario that, you know, just a few days ago announced more than 500 new cases. But what will it look like from our perspective? It will look different. Beyond that, what we do know is the sooner it comes, the bigger the peak and the worse the effect because the healthcare system will be really challenged to cope with it. The later it comes, the lower the peak and the less difficult it will be for the healthcare system to cope with it. Beyond that, no one can agree. Okay. So we, we don't know what in terms of numbers would constitute our peak to hit like 500 people just were announced to have COVID. Would that be the peak? You don't know. I mean, we're looking at uh, assumptions, and Dr. Rahman was very clear that the best case was assuming that over two years, 30, 32% of our population had had symptomatic COVID-19. Um, that assumption will only be shown to be true when you look at the data and see how we've gone. At the moment, we're doing slightly better than the projections would have suggested otherwise, but that's no cause for complacency. All you need, all you need is another cluster, another ember somewhere, and we will be back to the rate of growth that we saw in mid-March. And if we'd continued at that rate, without the effects of Dr. Fitzgerald's orders, we would be where Quebec is now. Right, thank you. And what were some of the signs that a surge is coming? You mentioned we might see a, a pickup of cases and then we can expect a peak in between three to four weeks. But what are some of the other symptoms to kind of, that you'll be, you will be looking out for? There isn't. It, the, the, you'll only know that the numbers have increased when the numbers increase. This is the challenge. The crystal ball isn't at all clear. We're looking at the future through a glass darkly, whatever analogy you like to use. We are estimating once we go from four in one day to 16 the next to 64 the day after that, to, you're on the slope. And then who knows how high it will go because you can calculate based on assumptions. Uh, but the, higher it, the earlier it comes, the higher it goes. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson of The Telegram. Please go ahead. Please press call one at this time. Uh, we know that N95 masks are the holy grail of protective masks, but uh, given the nurses' concern about their own protection, are surgical masks more effective than a typical homemade mask? Because you've said that uh, homemade masks will not protect the wearer. The use of masks is laid out in various guidelines that are evidence-based. N95s are for what are called aerosol-generating medical procedures, um, and those are the ones that one would normally find with people who have severe respiratory problems who would need interventions such as intubation or bronchoscopy. Surgical masks combined with eye protection, be it a shield built into the mask, or a face shield like you might see, the kind you can get from Canadian Tire, for example. Um, those are adequate and appropriate for those caregivers who do not find themselves exposed to aerosol-generating medical procedures. We've had lengthy discussions with healthcare union representatives 
Uh, and as recently as this morning, uh, I was involved in the last one. My understanding is we've reached a consensus uh, and we're ready to ink a document that will allow us to, to put that issue to bed uh, and look at uh, some other ones uh, in terms of how to prepare for the arrival of this virus. Uh, we have had some small incremental um, deliveries of masks. Uh, currently, uh, N95 masks uh, at our current what we call burn rate uh, are sufficient for the immediate short term as long as we continue to get deliveries and the timelines that the suppliers say we will. Because to be honest, they've been unreliable because the supply chain is a global issue and that has been very challenged lately. Thank you. And I'm also wondering if you have an update on the number of healthcare and frontline workers who are isolating uh, yeah. and or confirmed positive because uh, that would uh, affect the extra staffing of ICU beds. Is that not correct? Yes. I mean, the, 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 the slack, as it were, the capacity we have at the moment is the fact that our bed occupancy across the province averages 46 percent. So the empty beds are actually still staffed. So the staff that have been taken out of the system for self-isolation at the moment can be covered, although I gather the community area may be a little bit more of a challenge than the acute care. To answer your question specifically, there are 330 uh, workers in health care who are currently self-isolating, and there are 16 of those who have tested positive. We now have about 15 minutes left for questions, so we'll take single questions from each reporter, uh, following which uh, we will play the video from the Newfoundland and Labrador English School District, which I'm sure everybody will certainly enjoy. Our next question is from Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. You had briefly mentioned um, vaccines before, and I posed the question about what this means for school-aged children. Uh, do we have any further clarification on what we're doing in terms of vaccines? And if this goes into November, what that means for the flu vaccine season? The vaccination program, those who would have been vaccinated through the schools, we're working with the school district to identify those and to hook them up with an alternate delivery through, for example, public health. Uh, as for the flu season next year, uh, certainly we will be making our usual preparations in terms of identifying sources of vaccine uh, and uh, uh, quantities that we would need because those decisions are usually made in uh, uh, late summer, early fall. So there's no reason to believe that that would be any different for next time. The only challenge would be if we end up with another flu peak around the same time we have a lot of COVID-19 patients because they have similar requirements in terms of PPE and isolation. Having said that, the longer we can delay the arrival of that peak, the more likely we are to be able to have the supply chain piece sorted out because provincially we have some initiatives around manufacture, but the feds have really turned their, uh, their shoulders to the wheel to convert some areas of Canadian manufacturing to be able to uh, deliver PPE. I think the analogy was uh, there is always a Canadian supply for military uh, ammunition and guns. Now we're always going to have a Canadian supply for PPE for the healthcare sector. We're in the process of getting there. Thank you. Our next question is from Holly McKenzie Souter of the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Please first all one. Hello. Um, just one question on the funeral home cluster. Um, do we know how many of these cases um, up to date are linked to that? And I'm wondering if any of them have been detected outside of Eastern Health. Um, there's 177 cases that public health have advised me are linked uh, to the, uh, the funeral home cluster. I don't have the breakdown by region, but we could probably find that for you. Thank you. Our, ne our next question is from Ben Murphy of VOCM News. Please go ahead. 
Uh, Premier Ball, we hear endless praise for grocery store frontline essential workers right now calling them heroes, which is absolutely, of course, well-deserved. But a lot of them are just asking for simply some better pay. Are there any plans for anything in the works for these people who are out there providing this, maybe providing some hero pay when they're out there laying it on the line every day? Yeah, they are. And I think you, when you think about what we call essential workers within the province, and, you know, the grocery store could be the cashier, could be those people that are actually making sure that our, our shelves are stocked and keeping the place clean, and, you know, people that are just there providing the service that we need, services that we need. There's no question they are seeing this uh, on the front lines, and this is something that they're not really accustomed to. These, you know, over, I think when you look at the history of our province, most times we go in there and most of the customers, and I spent quite a number of years in retail, so, you know, most times you don't have to, you know, deal with unruly customers. But from time to time, some of the feedback that I've been getting here in the last few weeks or so, that there's some very, there's a level of frustration. People are waiting outside, waiting in long lineups to get inside, and some of that frustration is, you know, being taken out on our grocery store cashiers. And I'd ask people uh, to actually respect and consider, you know, the comments that they make from time to time to our grocery store workers who are doing a great job. So I know some companies that have reached, uh, they have stepped up and, and paid, uh, as mentioned, as you just said, hero pay. What we've been able to do as a province is to recognize that many of those workers require uh, child care services, and we've been able to work with them. And if they can provide a family child care space, it's $200 a week that we provide to them for those child care spaces. If they can't find one that would be, which is the preferred option to the family uh, care spaces, well, then we'll work with them to find one with an operator somewhere that's very close to them. So these are some of the things that we've been doing as a, uh, as a province in supporting those essential workers, especially our grocery store operators. What about those who don't have kids? Well, that was then, the second question. You only had time for one question, but, Premier, if you want to answer this, you can. Well, what, what is said there, well, of course, then that is not the extra expense that we're seeing, and they wouldn't add that added expense, so there's a, there's a benefit that we give to them, and some of them to the employers have stepped up and supported them. So right now we have a lot of essential workers, a lot of people that are doing some fabulous work you know, for, uh, for all of us in this province right now. And so some employers have stepped up. As a province, we've made sure that our public sector workers are all kept employed. Some of them are, are working from home, as I said. So we'll do whatever we can to support those workers. I can tell you some of the great uh, volunteers that we've had in our communities that have stepped up to support the trucking industry. So there's all kinds of things that's happening in our communities right now, recognizing the unsung heroes that we have on the essential lines supporting our province during this difficult time. Thank you. We have seven minutes left, so if reporters can keep their preamble really short. Next, we have Drew Brown of The Independent. Please go ahead. Okay, the, uh, the Nazis at government had to issue a statement clarifying that there were no COVID cases uh, in their jurisdiction um, after seeing on the official website something different. Uh, so in light of this, can you just clarify what's being done to ensure that Indigenous governments are being kept apprised of what's happening in their communities? So right now, there's, in terms of the Indigenous, well, just it's interesting you to ask that question today, because just prior to coming here, I had a, a chat with uh, Chief Miss L. Joe, and, you know, on some of the impacts on his communities as well, and some of the decisions that we're making. Uh, so when it comes to working with our Indigenous groups, we have, a, we have a, officials that are, are working with them. And when we look at the mechanisms and some of the changes that we've made as you go into Labrador, which is a, a big focus, uh, non-essential or essential travel only going into Labrador, we have some very stringent measures put in place for those that are traveling on, as you know, Minister Hakey just said a few minutes ago, from provincial airlines and uh, uh, from the only SCED service that we have, the own normal scheduled service we have, you know, Hevis Air and, and provincial airlines, airlines working with them for medevacs across our province. So there's very low numbers. So it's essential workers only going into Labrador. That is where we need to be. And from time to time, if we find the case where there's a non-essential person getting through the system, well, we're calling that out. It's as simple as that. We want to make sure that every single community as an understanding that our job is to put into protections, that we do not spread this virus around. So we've been doing this with our ferry system uh, from Blanc Blanc and to the Straits. We've got checkpoints in place in Fermont and Lab West. Right now, I would tell people, remind people, 
If you're traveling anywhere in this province, it's essential travel only. And I can tell you right now, this is a strong message that we need to spend, send. If there's anything that we could do in Indigenous communities or otherwise to slow the spread of COVID-19, essential travel only. But we must have some form of mechanism in case people need to get out for medical appointments or get those essential services in there. That is what we want to see in our province, essential services only. Could I just raise a kind of technical point? The uh, data that's presented in that table is based on home address, and it does not necessarily reflect where a person might have gone into self-isolation. Uh, it simply reflect, reflects their postal address for their permanent residence. Perfect. Thank you. The next question is from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, you talked about fish harvest or uh, fish plant workers. I'm wondering specifically about uh, people working on fishing vessels. Uh, they're in a very unique situation. Um, what is the recommendation for people who will be working in close quarters on those ships? So certainly we recommend physical distancing as much as possible, uh, recognizing that some situations that may be difficult. Um, uh, in those situations, the um, wearing a, uh, a mask may, uh, as we have recommended in, in public places, when you're not able to physically distance to wear a, a homemade uh, non-medical mask may be helpful. Um, but certainly physical distancing is the most important, um, uh, the most important mechanism to reduce the spread. Our next question is from Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. Your line is open. A practical question about uh, cooking and baking for especially elderly relatives or friends this weekend. Is there a health risk with people preparing food and dropping it off? Uh, so anytime we're preparing food, we have to make sure that we do that properly. So we have to make sure we wash our hands well and that our countertops are clean and that the utensils we use are clean because there's more than just COVID-19 to be worrying about. Um, so there's other uh, diseases such as salmonella that you can get. So we want people to be careful about that always. Uh, but uh, the information that we have right now certainly does not uh, indicate that there is a risk of uh, COVID-19 being transmitted through food um, or food packaging to any great degree that, that is in the literature, in the scientific literature. Um, obviously, uh, people need to make sure that they're, they are practicing safe hand washing and that uh, materials that are being uh, used to transport uh, food are not contaminated um, and uh, obviously if you are bringing it to a loved one's home that you're practicing safe physical distancing and not bursting anyone's bubble. Thank you. Our next question is from Elizabeth Witten of All Newfoundland Labrador. Please go ahead. Update regarding the situation in the St. Lawrence long-term care facility. Certainly, uh, the, st the residents have uh, all been tested, as have the, <clears throat> the staff. Uh, contact tracing is still continuing with some of the, the uh, edges of that, as it were. All the tests that have been done have come back negative thus far. Thank you. And our final question is from Peter Jackson of The Telegram. Please go ahead. Hello? Hello, Peter. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, first of all, I want to wish everyone a blessed Easter. And uh, I have one quick question about liquor express outlets. Why were they allowed to stay open given the demand for liquor as opposed to liquor stores? So the liquor outlets, you know, most of these would be in uh, convenience stores or attached to what would be another business. 
And so right now, I think at the time of the recommendations and when you look at the operations, it was felt that this was an add-on, not a standalone. So some significant measures have been put in place to support the major standalone uh, liquor, liquor uh, new NLC outlets throughout our province. So this was uh, attached to an existing business. And at that point, I'm not sure what the regular hours of operations and the changes that have been made, uh, online servicing and so on. But you know, we can get that information for you. But my understanding was just based upon the fact that it was in addition to what was an existing business. Thank you, Thank you Premier.